Okay, so again, um, welcome everyone. Nyung is already sharing her screen. So um, as you know, today we're going to talk um, about topics uh, of your interest, um, like the cost structure and the BIM model and a, a few more technical subjects that I actually personally have no idea about. So I'm gonna be learning a lot today as well. And uh, we have Nyung that you already um, interacted with a couple of times, I guess, on the, um, on the challenge. And we also have um, Anthony also from Horizon Legacy. And I'm gonna let everyone introduce themselves later on. And I'm handing it over to, to Nyung who's gonna start the introduction. Hey, um, thanks, Lisa. So hi, everyone. Um, good morning from Toronto, Canada. Um, so it's about eight o'clock in the morning right now. But for many of you, it's probably a late afternoon or evening. So um, it's a global competition. And we've got a lot of people from all over the world. So we find that really exciting. Um, <clears throat> before we start on the talk, I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page about the information that you have. So the first thing is a couple of weeks ago, you should have received the site description. Um, that's the plans for your site and talking about the land itself and what's nearby. And you should have also received a site plan in auto revit as well as different uh, other different formats. If you didn't receive those things, please contact us, either Lisa or myself through the platform and we need to make sure that uh, you have that information. Um, you should have also received a invitation for March check-ins. So we've scheduled, um, each team will have one hour to discuss one-on-one uh, -on -one with us, um, your individual questions and project. <clears throat> so um, if you haven't scheduled that meeting, please do so because we expect um, after today that a lot of people will want to book. So make sure you book the time that you're available and, and that we're available. Um, in addition to that, um, this week we will be uh, releasing probably through YouTube five videos in a series of about 15 to 20 videos. And the subject matters that they cover is, it's going to be short. So it's basically a building 101 in a nutshell. And it's not intended to educate you about everything that's required to build a building, but it's just going to highlight some key topics and concepts that you should be aware of when you're going through and designing your building. <clears throat> So the topics that we're covering um, this week is, the first one is the building information model, why we're using it. The second one is site preparation, um, evaluation and foundation. And even though you're not responsible for that in this competition, we're gonna just explain to you the basics of what we're doing so um, that you know what precedes you. The third part is gonna be what goes into a building. So the key parts that you should consider in your building. And then mechanical electrical plumbing systems and another important consideration, uh, designing buildings for cold Canadian climate. And some people um, may be already familiar with that because they live in countries that are as cold as Canada. So for example, um, this past week in Canada, we just had a major snowstorm and that's a normal thing for us where we live. So we just wanna make sure that for those who are un unfamiliar with that, that um, you consider some of these aspects. <clears throat> so today in attendance um, on behalf of the Marco Polo team is um, Anthony Zweig and Andrew Fontini. And they're gonna be speaking to you about a couple of important things that you need to know in the competition. Um, Andrew is our uh, lead architect, so he's the person that will be providing your guidance on the Ontario Building Code and any local building code requirements. And Anthony will be speaking to you about costs and schedules. He's the CEO of Horizon Legacy, um, and so he's an important decision maker in this uh, challenge and an important person. So um, listen carefully to what he has to say. Um, you know me, of course, and um, my colleague, uh, Frank Bellarique, who's very experienced on all matters of construction. And so if you have any questions about construction, construction management, or how to execute your construction project or plan it, 
he's the person to talk to about that. And then in addition to that, we have two extremely capable ladies, um, Lisa and Emily, who have been coordinating and helping us um, do the administration and coordination and answer all your questions. So um, I mentioned, so this is today's agenda. So we're gonna cover cost and schedule and how to plan for and think about some of these things. We're also gonna give you a high level overview of the Ontario Building Code. And then um, at the later half of the workshop, we'd like to just open it up to you. This is sort of an informal session. So bring whatever uh, questions or things that we need to discuss. Um, we kind of view this as a collaborative session. So we want to work with you um, to make sure that uh, it fits, everything fits well. So with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Tony. Good morning or good morning for us and good day to everybody. And again, I want to echo uh, what uh, Lisa and Young have said. Uh, I want to congratulate everyone uh, for your submissions. We're quite excited about them and seeing some of the ideas that are being proposed. And so we're looking forward uh, to actually building some of them. So uh, just wanted to review uh, what our objectives were. And we laid out uh, this objective to see if we could have a building built for $100 per square foot of construction cost. And uh, this is uh, just the construction cost and we will talk about other costs that uh, you don't have to concern yourself with that actually add to the cost of the building. But the goal in this competition is to uh, produce uh, these buildings for $100 a square foot and to cut the construction time in half. And um, as you know, the, this stage uh, is towards building a, a two-story, three-unit apartment building. And then the last stage is to use that same technology to build a larger 12-story building. Um, we, obviously, uh, any design has to be Ontario Building Code compliant. That's the law to be able to construct here in Ontario. And we just want to remind you while we're all interested in getting the lowest cost possible, uh, these buildings will be lived in, so they need to be desirable places that appeal to uh, Ontario residents who will consider it as their home. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in our world, uh, we divide costs into hard costs and soft costs. Hard costs are the materials, the labor, the equipment that goes into what's physically created and remains on the site. Now it includes things that don't stay on the site. For example, think about a crane you might rent that's only there for the construction or a 3D printer or any piece of equipment that comes to contribute to the physical work that goes on there. Also work that may take place or activity that may take place off site, such as prefabrication work inside of a factory setting outside of the site, that activity and the cost of it would be considered part of hard construction costs. Also the transportation of either materials or manufactured panels or units. Uh, again, in a prefabrication uh, scenario, those transportation costs are also uh, part of hard costs. Uh, what are known as soft costs uh, are pretty much everything else. It's uh, the work, sometimes we say it's the work that's done inside architects, engineers, consultants, uh, environmental uh, work, um, any marketing uh, expenses, financing, permits, regulation, legal and accounting. But for purposes of Marco Polo, uh, we, we're just addressing and focusing and want you to focus your energies on the hard costs. 
And I, I saw a question even across the screen uh, when Jung was talking. Um, the activity we want you to uh, work on is from the ground up. We will be performing the subsoils activity, which involves investigations to determine what's necessary to be done to support a building uh, structurally, what's necessary to make sure there aren't contaminants. That work we will do. And even though that's normally considered a hard cost, uh, for purposes of this competition, you do not need to look at that and you do not need to include that in your $100 a foot. We will provide a foundation or a, either a platform or columns upon which uh, you will then place your building. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to pull up the document here. Yeah. Explain that. Okay, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, and um, just uh, one other point about the uh, hard cost. Uh, another hard cost is one of bringing services, utilities like gas, electricity, water to, this, uh, to the site. Again, that's properly a hard cost, but for purposes of this challenge, we will be looking after that and you do not need to include that in your cost. You need to include the connection, which will bring to the perimeter of the building and then the internal uh, distributions of electricity and water. So here, this is the start of the costing template that uh, we're going to send you uh, later today or tomorrow. And, uh, you know, aside, and for those of you who are experienced in construction, I think these things will be uh, fairly self-evident. We want to make sure that there, uh, for those of you who aren't, that you see what we're looking for. This sheet will help you arrive at your costs. And what it's doing here is it's laying out the areas in, in quantities and a, uh, at the start, the basic floor areas uh, that you're proposing and how to measure them. And in this area from a line nine to 16, we're talking about the total floor area. So if you had a tape measure and you could hold it on the outside wall of the outside walls and run through the thickness of the walls through to the other opposite walls, those are the measurements uh, we want you to uh, calculate. And that's to help you understand what your construction areas are because you will then be multiplying that by unit costs for the various materials or various work. And that's a key component to arriving at your costs. It also uh, helps us to understand what it is you're proposing. Um, now, if we go down to lines 20 to 31, we're talking about the areas inside the living it in the apartments. So you would hold your tape measure figuratively or however you do it uh, at the inside walls of the apartment units, you would go through partitions to the opposite wall, inside wall. And this is important to understand um, how much uh, interior livable space uh, you're producing uh, for the given amount of gr uh, gross floor area, which is calculated above. Uh, and young, if um, uh, we, we just scroll down, you can see there just line 35 and note, um, you know, the, be the best backup, you know, we're seeking backup because we want to be able to rely 
on the cost proposed. So the best backup is an actual quote, or if there's third party estimates, any kind of supporting information uh, is helpful. And now what we've done now going uh, from line 38 down, you'll see we've, we've given examples. We don't expect you to need to fill in all these things. Uh, for example, in line 43, it says equipment and machines rented. Uh, and then line 44, equipment and machines purchased. Uh, you may not be renting, you may be purchasing or vice versa. Uh, this is just as a thought provoker to try and ensure that uh, you pick up everything, uh, all the items that are going to go into your building. And uh, as we go down to A2 at line 50, you can see uh, we're saying maybe the structural component is wood or maybe it's metal or maybe concrete. Um, so uh, it's only what, what's needed uh, to describe um, what you're proposing. Um, then in A3, we're talking about enclosures walls, um, exterior walls, exterior doors, and windows. Um, just to go to, a, to what Young was talking about, our cold climate. Uh, an important part of construction here is the ceiling between various items, between the doors and the windows and the walls. And uh, uh, here in Canada, there's uh, uh, continual discussion of, about pros and cons of different methods of sealant, because that's where a lot of problems show themselves. Uh, interiors, uh, you can see it's interior partitions, doors, door hardware, our hinges and locks. Um, the apartment doors out uh, to the public, whether, uh, you know, whether it's to outside or to a public hall, should have a lock on it. And uh, finishes uh, and are, are up to you. Um, you know, again, it's typically a trade-off between uh, costs and uh, something that's appealing uh, to market to residents. You know, we live as a an owner and operator of buildings, we, we live and think about uh, from a perspective of clients or potential clients have a lot of choices. And so we want our buildings to be attractive. So uh, prospective tenants will wanna come look at what uh, we're proposing and we'll be proposing um, what uh, we select to build from your submission. Uh, okay, Young, we can keep going down. And we have um, mechanical and electrical. Uh, some of this will come up again uh, in the video. Right now, there's codes and laws requiring residences to be heated. Uh, uh, right now, it is not the law to have air conditioning. But we've noticed uh, more and more discussions in the press and amongst the regulators, given uh, the extreme heat that we've experienced in the summers here, uh, there's been questions about whether air conditioning should become a requirement. Um, um, exhaust systems typically relate to bathrooms and kitchens. Uh, kitchen areas. Um, and uh, the electrical, again, I think it, it speaks for itself. Um, you know, you, you have to provide light. Um, you, uh, you know, the utilities are monitored in the suites, uh, your energy usage. So that's really an electrical uh, component. Uh, and so these are our items. There are also life safety requirements. Uh, it, certainly in the large building, uh, there, there's uh, 
a lot more intensity to make sure in the case of a fire. And for the most part, life safety refers to issues of fire and smoke suppression, evacuation of a building should there be uh, an incident. Um, and um, then again, um, general requirements and overheads refers to what we call uh, our duties performed by a general contractor. And we will engage and pay for somebody for you and their basic services you do not have to include in your hundred dollars a foot. But in a normal course, in a, they are part of a hard cost. And they perform the functions to make sure the construction uh, conforms to the laws. You know, they will put up the hoarding or the fencing. They will have the first aid kits. They will uh, make sure the site principally is safe um, and uh, provide uh, those items so a construction site can function. Uh, Okay, no. um, And for the large building, we're looking at the small building. It's the same other than uh, there's more floors and principally the large building, uh, we'd expect to have elevators in the two-story building. Very. Uh, also, in the large buildings, uh, we use garbage chutes here. And so that allows tenants, uh, without having to leave their floor, to take their garbage somewhere in the hallway and deposit it in a chute where it falls down to a uh, receptacle down on the ground floor and the building management will take it out. Uh, until about 10 years ago, buildings had one chute and everything went into the one chute. Now, uh, the rules are pushing uh, that there be three chutes, one for uh, recycling, one for uh, biological or wet garbage, and one for dry garbage. Uh, we, we had the pleasure or displeasure of having about 10, 12 years ago, the uh, first building uh, to have to actually install one of these triple shoots in the building. Um, okay, young, I think we can move on. Um, And so uh, time is obviously another key element uh, that uh, we're looking to you people to address. Um, time, you know, the shorter the time, frankly, the, the less the cost. Uh, typically buildings are financed and interest during construction is an important uh, and significant cost. Uh, here, uh, in uh, the first five lines, we've laid out a, um, a typical construction time using a traditional process of 13 months. Now, again, this is after the soils work has been done, after the foundation has been done, and uh, with, with the pad or the foundation finished and then ready to put the building on top actual construction uh, where you'd have to include digging down and uh, doing this other work uh, probably adds another six months. But again, here's a target we just wanted to share with you for uh, just the part of the work you're involved in where we're suggesting the structure uh, and the topping off, actually finishing the roof uh, from the start might take five months, closing in the exterior windows, walls and doors would take four months, starting about halfway into the five months. Uh, mechanical and electrical work 
uh, projected takes about three months. Again, starting uh, when the enclosing activity is about halfway done. Interior partitions take another three months. Again, overlapping with the mechanical and electrical work. And then finishes fixtures and equipment. Um, you know, here we're showing it not starting till everything else is done. In truth, uh, there is an overlap uh, as soon as typically, as soon as uh, we could clear out two or three floors, um, you would try to get the uh, finishing people in to start doing their work. But here, we just said assume that it started after everybody's done and that they would take another three months and so we're hoping uh, to see with uh, your innovative processes uh, a significant improvement on uh, these time frames uh, okay and um, the, there's various ways and tools to help you track your time. Uh, we use a term called a, a PERT chart. Uh, the, there's different names for it. And it basically lays out in sequence how one activity follows the other. So you lay out the time of each activity. And then when one is done, uh, you can start the subsequent activity. Or you can see here in this sample between mobilization and demo, uh, the first two green bars, uh, the one activity overlaps another. Um, so when you add up uh, all your discrete individual activities, which may be different trades, um, then you get your total time frame to complete the project. The, the key here. Uh, and again, where we see all the anxiety and problems come from is in dealing with dependencies, where one activity has to be done before the subsequent one can start. Uh, and in, in real life, it's more complex because typically maybe two or three activities have to be finished together before a certain new one has to start. And uh, I encourage you to just think realistically about the dependencies because there's a cascading effect in either a positive or negative way uh, if the planning gets those dependencies right. Because you can see the coordination issues if you've arranged the delivery and the good news is the delivery shows up on time uh, with supplies, but the bad news is uh, the area that needed to be finished being built isn't done. And now there's a number of problems. One is where to store those materials and what's happening to the subsequent trades. So this is an area of the dependencies and the coordination. Um, is uh, from our experience is where uh, the problems arise. So I encourage you to look at it, look at it in detail. Um, and one part of that to help be accurate on it is to build in contingencies uh, uh, just for late deliveries. I'll, I'll give you one extreme example. We had one situation where we ordered granite that we liked very much and it came from a, a quarry in the north of Sweden that was serviced by only one rail line that was generally closed in the winter. And so we, we had to think hard about whether we still wanted to order that granite and then what contingencies and timeframes to use to integrate it into a uh, building schedule. Um, and so there's software uh, that can uh, help organize the, the thinking and display dependencies and conflicts. Um, okay. Um, is Andrew here? 
Um, I think I. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sandra's here. Yeah, yeah. I, I got. Okay. I'm here. Hi, everyone. I'm Andrew <laughs> Frontini. Sorry, I joined late. I had to bring my daughter to school. Um, so, so, so you want me to get, walk you through yeah. this, this slide? Sure, certainly. So the the main reference uh, uh, build code code for this project will be the Ontario Building Code, which you you can download download uh, download online for free. And you know what it basically does is it promotes the health, safety, fire protection, and resource conservation for buildings. And this the sections that that are really going to be really applicable to you are are really section three, which deals with critical dimensions for um, accessibility for uh, all of the kind of technical requirements for vertical transportation for fire safety. So those are the things that you want to get in to in detail. I, I would familiarize yourself with it. And, you know, it is based on a uniform international standard. So for, for, for many of you, these things will not be unfamiliar. Um, uh, these standards apply to health and safety, fire protection, structural sufficiency, construction materials, plumbing and mechanical systems. And I, I don't know, Tony, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning. I don't know if you've walked people through what the 30% um, uh, no, deliverable looks. No, actually looks. I, I didn't. Uh, okay. No. okay, but we'll get, we'll get to that in a bit. But you know, you will be looking at the, the basic configuration of your building being established so that it's code compliant. And you know, also Division Nine of the code covers small buildings and residences. So you'll want to look at what are the requirements for a window in a bedroom, things like that. Now these are all um, many of them will be common sense to you. We live in a society where most most contemporary buildings are are designed to a uniform code. But my my advice or our advice to you is to is to download this and and kind of peruse it, understand what the sections are. And in our subsequent workshops, as you begin to develop your design, come forward with, with any specific questions you're going to have. Obviously, we're not going to orient you to the whole code in the, on this call. But if you have, if you get into your design and you're and you're having uh, trouble with it with an issue, is it a fire separation or is it how the accessibility standards uh, apply to the dimensions of your units for a washroom, for example? You can bring those those questions forward, and we can we can help guide you to the specific section of the code that will answer your question. And there is also a, uh, an, an appendix to the Ontario Building Code, which is an illustrated guide, which is extremely helpful, particularly for understanding issues around uh, barrier-free access. Any questions there? Um, Andrew, maybe, could you just... Uh explain you know the term barrier free access oh yeah ba what barrier free access re relates to is the ability for people of any physical ability to be able to navigate a building uh, in kind of equal terms with someone who's able-bodied and so this applies to uh, principally physical disabilities and covers clearances and dimensions around wheelchairs scooters walkers, assistive devices. And it also uh, considers the ability of someone who is older, walks slowly or walks with difficulty to access and use a building. So the, ca the things that really um, that are covered in the code have to do with the, the width of doors, um, the way the door swing works in a space and the clearances around it. So can someone open the door if they're in a wheelchair? Is there enough room for their wheelchair to back off, open the door? Um, is there enough room on the left-hand side uh, or right-hand side of the pull or push for them to get clearance? There are specific dimensions there. If they're in a space and they need to turn around, there's a, there's a 17, Hundred clearance um, for a wheelchair and a 2,400 millimeter clearance for a scooter, and those are requirements in different kinds of spaces. Uh, within an individual unit, you don't necessarily need those clearances in every space, but you'll want to provide them in the main living space. And um, again, uh, it's it's there are spatial requirements. A barrier-free washroom is larger than a non-barrier-free washroom. But I think what you want to think about, and I don't know if you've talked about this, Tony, is you want to make your uh, your units to a degree marketable. And I, and I would 
familiarize yourselves with what an apartment building looks like in Ontario, just generically, um, so that you, you understand what would be acceptable. The code will, does give you a good understanding of that um, because everyone, those are the minimums uh, and an introduction of a barrier-free washroom will need a washroom that is more gracious and, um, and, and I would advise that your washrooms are barrier-free in each unit you have one barrier-free washroom. Um, yeah. Andrew, I was just gonna ask you about that and you'd be more up to date than me. Uh, my understanding was that not every unit needed to be barrier free. Are you that, that is that that no, that is correct by code. You you there's a right. mix, and that that is described in the code as well. Um, okay. Yes, you're not obliged to, um, but I think there. Uh, you you and I forget what that mix is. Uh, I'll give you an example. We did a student residence last year, and out of 34 units two units were barrier free uh, mm -hmm. but to to uh, an AODA standard which meant we were accommodating scooters so they were much larger uh, so uh, that, that percentage mix we can help you we can we can look that up and send that out um, but I would start with uh, yeah. there's a question okay. here too uh, someone uh, how are we dealing with questions in the chat are we dealing with them as they come up yeah, we're just going to take them at the end. So I think we're oh, at the end, okay. Anyway. Okay. Um, I, think, I, I think on the barrier free, I, um, we may need to give some more clarification. But Andrew, I think we, yeah. we should have uh, our own discussion. Um, yeah, uh, what standard yeah, do you want uh, to set? Just to make just to help everyone out. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's the um, end of the presentation. So we wanted to leave the rest for just talking, um, whatever questions you have, or if you wanna discuss certain aspects with us. Um, one thing that we didn't talk about in this competition in detail is the um, working with the local construction manager. So that person would be either Frank, who is on today's call, or uh, Eric. And these two individuals can help work with you to plan the construction of your building and your design. So we'll do that in a subsequent workshop and talk about how to do that. Um, and in a subsequent workshop, we'll be addressing um, other issues. For example, we're gonna be going into detail about how to calculate the building envelope. So today we gave you a costing template um, that you fill in and that will be made available on the FAQ uh, uh, section of the uh, challenge platform. Um, and in future, we're gonna be going into detail about how to calculate your building envelope, um, working with engineers, architects, and construction managers, as well as the regulators, because we'll be interacting with them once you proceed to the finals. Um, we're going to be discussing approval process for new materials. If any of you um, are considering using new materials in your buildings, we'll be going over um, what the process looks like in Canada. Um, and then we'll also be touching on the subject of designing for the end user. So uh, we want these buildings to be livable. And so what are the key considerations for that? So um, I will go and read some of the questions here, starting from the top. Uh, first question from Ed, is the cost of foundation calculated in the cost per square meter? Um, not for your purposes. Uh, as uh, I was trying to say earlier, um, for us, it will be part of our cost, but that is outside your uh, pursuing the hundred dollars a foot. Okay, and there was a similar question from Vladimir at previous call. It was said that the foundation prep is not part of the total project cost. So yes, that is the case. Um, we're saying um, we will provide and offer the foundation or create the foundation for you. So you just have to build the building on top of it. So you don't have to um, calculate that cost as part of your project cost. Okay, so next question is from Ed. 
again, um, does the Ontario code require fire suppression in all concrete multi-unit construction? Secondly, is a wet sprinkler system required? So I think I'm going to direct this to Andrew. So Andrew, does yeah. the Ontario yeah, the answer, the first, the answer to the first question is yes, and I would recommend a wet sprinkler system is that would be your most cost effective and easiest to maintain. Okay. So, sorry, Andrew, you're saying in all the units. The you're it's a sprinkler building. Again, and again, you're much closer uh, yeah. to me, but you know, I know. Um, you know, in the big building, obviously the garbage room and areas like that. Yeah. Um, I thought, is it um, not optional to sprinkler a building? And certainly, well, it, it depends building. on the classifications. But this is a t this is a tall building. It's six stories. So, it's well, it's over six store over six stories. So it's it's effectively a high rise, and it has to be sprinklered completely because uh -huh. of its height. Because of its height, that's uh -huh. the principal driver. But not the two-story building. No, correct. No, it does not need to be. No. Yeah. And 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 so you're saying that the twelve-story building. Uh, the units. The units would be sprinkler. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. Next question from Chris. Um, transportation cost-wise, how can we know the nearest available facilities, say prefab factories, et cetera, to the site location? Okay, so I think I could answer this one. So um, in your site description, um, we, we explained that we had to keep, we wanted to keep the site uh, private for now, just to protect the confidentiality of the landowner. They wanted us to do that uh, at this stage. But what we would recommend is in the one-on-one -on -one meetings um, happening in March, please tell us what your needs are. So if you said, okay, I have um, this amount of equipment, I need to bring it to site. Here's the weight dimensions of the equipment. Um, we can work with you to give you information um, about the site so that you can plan it accordingly. So what we can, what you do know about the site is one that it has highway access and street access. And you can see from the photos, the width kind of roughly that it'll accommodate, um, you know, um, standard trucks or vehicles or pro probably even cranes. The second thing is that it has um, access to the water. So um, we can deliver things by water and it's very close in close proximity to the water. I think it's less than five kilometers away from uh, the water. It's a walking distance, it's a short distance. So that means that you can deliver anything from Europe or Asia through the water system um, to this site. Um, and then in terms of prefabrication factories, so that's, I think, a unique uh, characteristic of your project. So please talk to us in the one-on-one -on -one meetings and we will uh, work with you on that. Uh, next question from Dimitri. As I understood, there is no gas pipeline or central heating line by the site. What kind of heating should we plan for the big building? So I'm going to direct this to Frank. Uh, hi. Um, there's a push in Ontario to go all electric, you know, for, for, for heating. Um, most, you know, for environmental reasons, everybody's converting to clean fuels and electricity falls into that category so we we envision that it'll be an all-electric uh, building um, we also uh, would require that uh, the units all be individual metered submetered um, so that uh, energy use can be charged to the appropriate apartment i hope that answers your question mm -hmm. um next question Again, about sprinklered, sprinklered or unsprinklered, Horizon has any specific requirements. So that question was answered earlier, yeah. and the answer was sprinkled system in every unit. In the big right. building. In the yeah. big building. Yeah. yeah. Um, next question from Vladimir. Um, I previously looked over the Ontario Building Code and couldn't find full clarification for legal light and air windows. Does specifically does Ontario have a minimum clearance in front of light and air windows here in New York City? It's defined as 
30 um, feet to zero inches. 30 feet, zero inches. I think you meant 30 inches. Thank you. So the question is, um, is there a requirement, a specific he's requirement? The co he's saying clear, so I'm not sure I understand the question. Is that um, setback? Is the question me? Yeah, I was wondering if that was limiting distance. If that yeah. was limiting distance. from a neighboring building. Vladimir, I don't know if you're on the line, but do you want to clarify your question? Hello. Um, so the 30 foot distance is from anything, including neighboring buildings or any kind of obstructions uh, in NYC. That's why I'm just asking if Ontario yeah. has any kind of requirements like that. There, there is a, that's uh, called limiting distance and it's actually a calculation you do and it relates the area of your facade to uh, through the distance to uh, the property line. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, when there is not a built condition on the property line or there's, it's not possible, say, say beside the property line, there was a cliff into the ocean, then you would, you would just, you would not have that requirement, but here it would be based here. You do have the potential for a neighboring property. So I would, I would calculate the limiting distance. I would calculate it from the lot line mm -hmm. and, and, and base it, assuming that there's a potential for another building to have a zero lot line condition. Well, the main reason that I'm bringing this up is uh, we already laid out our units and we realized yeah. that we're going to have to have an interior courtyard to the building. So oh, the, oh, the so courtyard about... has to have yeah. so, so yes. dimension, you know? Correct, correct, correct. Okay. All right. So, um, well, that's then, then you would apply the... It's different. That's the limiting distances between your building and another building, which are separate fire mm -hmm. compartments. Um, I'd have to look into that uh, question for you. I know what you're talking about, particularly where you have a right angle condition, right? You know, at the corner of the courtyard, what is the separation? Well, I know that there- Maybe- uh, Diagonally. It's just, it's just New York City code is kind of extensive and they cover yeah. a lot of issues that the international doesn't even go into. And yeah. this, this distance pertains just, if you're looking out of a window directly yeah. out, uh, yes. that you don't have any obstructions in front of this window within the 30 feet of life. Right. Right. Uh, because yeah. what they're, they're arguing is if there's like a building within 20 feet, this window is no longer good enough to bring light yeah. and air into the unit. It's not a healthy right. unit. Uh, right, right. It, it's not fire related. There's a different it's section. About, it's related. about, yeah. Okay, it's about really about the occupants. Occupancy it's health. Good. Yeah. It's yeah, well, so... Uh, the, you know that i mean that's an i know that those things are often covered in um the zoning or mm -hmm. building guidelines for municipality like toronto has its tall building and mid-rise building guidelines which cover conditions like that so maybe what we should do um is i'll we'll look through the code again but maybe we should we should we should advise of a standard and base it on the new york city guideline well i i can imagine um would we, that I'm trying to think. I've seen, say, um, well, certainly in a, an interior courtyard, but uh, here I don't think we have that. It's really about fire separation. You know, yeah. the side of the window uh, goes into a calculation. <laughs> Those surfaces goes into yeah. a calculation. It's how far you have to be from an adjoining building. I think we'll. I guess we we want to see what your calculation is, but we will um, try to help locate the neighboring buildings, you know, because you're one of yeah. potentially <laughs> five, uh, and then we'll have to locate it from the property line. I'm not sure. Well, this that... is for the big building or the small building for, for starters. This is for the big building. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Tony, I think the issue here, I mean, it's a fairly large site and, and I, what I would, I would approach it almost probably the governing factor is going to be the sort of attractiveness or marketability of the of the units. So so I think I would try and create a gracious courtyard. I think I mean I would say that the kind of attractiveness of the unit will probably be the governing factor well, because that, uh, as Tony says there's no I doubt there's a municipal 
um, or yeah. zoning uh, or, or around the built form for to town of this size. I could look so to the Toronto. Tr I could look to the Toronto mid mid rise building guidelines, and and they're probably something. They're probably less stringent, uh, yeah. well, more stringent than say, New York. Yeah, I would. Let's look at Toronto, and I think we're going to have to come back. Uh, my, you know, it's up to uh, Vladimir or all the designers to, on their own, decide what they want to do with respect to the aesthetics of the unit and what you work out at. Um, for, I, I guess we should look at it. What I'm thinking is it's probably, we should look, but I, I have a sense well, we may end up just saying what the, the fire code or the fire regulations require X and um, that'll be the requirement. The aesthetics is, is something for you to think about and we'll, we'll make an assessment when we see it. But let us come back to you on that. Yeah, we'll come back to you with a response. I think we need to look into it a bit. Okay, so uh, I actually love these kind of questions because it shows that you've already done uh, a lot of thinking and work into your design. And so these are really specific questions. So keep going with these types of questions and don't hesitate to bring other questions like these to um, our one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to contact us. You can contact us by email or on the platform or in the one-on-one -on -one sessions and we'll try to get back to you as, as quickly as possible to do a quick turnaround. So next question um, is from Kurt. Are you looking for roughly 30% barrier free? So I'm gonna direct this to Andrew. Yeah, and sorry, I misspoke earlier when, when I said we'd done two uh, out of 34 units, we'd actually done two apartments totaling six individuals out of 34. So it's closer to 20%, I think, but, uh, or 25. I'm gonna, I'm gonna confirm that. Yeah, I think uh, we need to talk about that too and then come back to everybody with an answer. Yeah. Um, but it um, would be less, yeah, I think it's gonna be significantly less than the 30%. Well, again, these are, you know, Tony, these are our market factors as well. I mean, you will get a recommendation out of the OBC. Right. You will, again, you're a high rise building. So you start getting into specific requirements, but then oh, for sure, for sure. But then, but then you're also going to say, you know, in this community, who's renting these you, you, and again, barrier free units really apply to a lot of conditions with seniors and people have assistive devices or you have a married couple and one of them's in a wheelchair. So you know, washrooms that have level entrance and room for those devices to move around, they're marketable. So I would be thinking about your demographics as well. Yeah, okay, and we'll talk I can about just it. add into, into this. Um, one of the things about Ontario is that uh, it, you talk about marketability and most certainly if all the units have extra wide doors and large washrooms and accessibility, then it becomes a far more marketable product yeah. overall, rather than limiting yourself to 30%. I mean, it's simply a design change to say that I want to put in a, a 40 inch door instead of a 32 inch door. And the same thing with the washroom, being able to turn, um, being able to go into a washroom with a walker is probably yeah. one of your bigger issues. Correct. Um, just wanted to put that out there. No, I think that's that's a very valuable point. And I think we should provide some clarity around this uh, yeah. just to level the playing field. Um, no, for, for sure. And, and obviously it, the other side is what's the impact on cost? Uh, sure, well, it, it, that's what yeah. I mean, because if so, you know, I think everyone needs to be shooting for the same target. Um, and, and we have not established, if, if I'm mis not mistaken, Tony, we have not established a unit mix, right? We've set, we've set a grow we've set a gross floor area, but we've not said we want so many three bedrooms, two bedrooms, bachelors, right? Well, if actually, there's... I th I think we did. Young, did we not? Um, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, boy, I can't lay my hands on it. No, okay. you specified well, in the in your initial meeting. You specified that there was going to be a mix of single unit 
two uh, two person unit and family units. You didn't you didn't knock that down to specifics, but you did mention that you wanted a, a blend of the three. My suggestion is just simply that we say right across the board, let's just make these all accessible. That way you're not putting up any arbitrary barriers between uh, people who can afford certain units. Uh, particularly in Ontario, what we're finding uh, is that the, the population is getting much older. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Accessibility is an issue, but on top of that is how many people can actually afford their first home. This also becomes a, uh, an issue. So cost wise, we have to keep that down to allow people to come into the unit, but then um, if they plan to stay there for any length of time, you know, even if you have an accident, let's say you fall on the ice and you break the legs and you're walking around with crutches is a pain in the ass trying to move through a small door. So those, yeah. are, those are just some of the considerations that we were looking at. Yeah, I think those are really good points. And, and even young families, you've got strollers. It's, it's, it's as cumbersome as a wheelchair. So, so the kind of, I think maybe what we should do is establish no, a we're, short we're, order. We'll establish, yeah. a, as you say, you know, Andrew, it's a, it's a good idea, a goal for yeah. this. Um, I just know from our experience, I, I want to sound like a, too much of a curmudgeon, uh, you know, barrier units, no question, uh, are better socially, but they don't come without a cost. Well, they add square footage, certainly, yeah. And, and um, you know, you know, a key objective here is, is to try to drive a cost, but I think what we need to do is come out with yeah. well, well, let me, and we'll yeah. communicate that. Yeah, yeah, and so you know we'll, what I would have, we'll what I would, Tony, you know, let's do, we'll do that. And, and I think, but what I would encourage all the contestants to do is to take a modular approach to, to the planning so that, you know, you could put in a barrier free one bedroom unit or, or a non barrier free two bedroom unit, you know, or, or you have it, you, or, or you could have put in two, two studios or bachelors in place of a two bedroom to have a modular approach that allows you to um, without completely scrapping your design, change that that mix because uh, this happens all the time in residential developments that a, an initial unit mix is is devised, start selling or looking at market interest. You find that there's a, a real just and this happened quite recently in Ontario that the the pressure for larger u two and even three bedroom units started to uh, push and if, if a developer could consolidate three studios into a three bedroom or family unit, then they had a much more marketable prod, uh, product. So um, to, to maybe be thinking about that as you lay the floor plans out, how much adaptability is there in the layout? Or have you shoehorned yourself into a unit mix that can't be changed? Because we, we you know we have quite a quite a lot of space around us on this site, so we shouldn't we shouldn't um, back ourselves into a corner in any design solution, because it's quite possible that even as someone wins the competition, then we kind of go through a process of refining this for the given market, that that mix will change. Mm -hmm. Great, so um, okay. we're passing the one hour yeah. mark and we still have 19 more minutes, uh, sorry, 19 more messages. So I just wanna go sure, keep as moving. many as possible. And then if we're not able to get through all the uh, questions, then um, we're going to review it and post the answers on the website so you have uh, answers to these questions. So next question is, uh, I think this is an easy one for you. Andrew, what is the scooter you were talking about? Oh, an electric, it's an electric uh, mobility device like a wheelchair but bigger and it requires a 2400 millimeter circle for it to turn around. Uh, so sorry, my camera's not on, I apologize. So uh, that, that, that's just uh, an enhanced level of accessibility. Okay. Um, next question is from Shazil. Determination of building footprint given non-conventional designs. So I think this is a question about how you calculate the building footprint. Um, I'm going to say we are, we will be addressing this in the next um, workshop, calculating uh, building footprint and um, your square footage. So we're going to go into detail about gross floor area, 
livable floor area, et cetera. So please stay tuned for this question. Um, but just on that, Young, know, I'm not sure, you know, as I was hearing the question, I thought, oh, and I could be way off. Um, if, for example, the shape is a circle or a series of circles, I would think you can get the area of a circle, um, but you know, don't know um, what the uh, what the design thinking is. So maybe we'll have to deal with that one on one. Yeah, yeah. So those are the two options. Okay, so Lisa sent some questions that we received um, before the before today's session. Um, some people sent questions um, in advance. So first question, our structures require contractors and machine builders like Robomap. Perhaps there are machines for making hinges that will be cheaper. We would like to get acquainted with the available machine tool park and production technology. Okay, so with this question, we recommend that um, please in your one-on-one -on -one meetings, talk to us about that, send us information in advance. What do you need? Um, explain your process. We recommend you do that uh, instead of in a session like this. Uh, it's, it's unique to you. Um, next question. The small building intended to be constructed by sponsor and or constructor in accordance with the design will have two floors, three residential units, totaling approximately 132 square meters. Can we suggest a building with a height of three floors? Taking into account that one of the floors will be technical, should we place three residential units in a 132 square meter building or should each residential unit be 132 square meters? So answer to the second one is all three units um, totaling 132 square meters. And the question for, can we have three floors? I'll defer that to Tony. Do you have any opinions on this or? Well, is the total building area, uh, boy, uh, you know what, I'm not sure. I guess my question is, will that increase the total building area? Um, and again, if so, then I see that as increasing the cost of the building. And so, and actually, in Young Brothers yesterday, you know, we were talking about chasing dollars per square foot because it's a, um, a comparable unit of measure. But uh, another measure that's important is what is the total square footage to produce uh, these three units? And uh, so uh, we, you need to keep an eye on that. Uh, because it, it's the total cost uh, is important in producing the three apartments. Uh, but I think from a code perspective, there's no reason, or a site planning perspective, there would be no real reason that you couldn't do a three-story instead of a two-story. Um, I think it would be up to you to decide whether you can do it cost-effectively. And and you're and as Tony was saying, you know, we're going to assume that you're going to achieve the same efficiency you know if it's 130 uh two square meters that's your gross area and you're going to fit the three units and you want your units to be uh, comparable with someone else's units that are on two floors so you want to test your efficiency your net which is the interior area of the rentable apartment to the gross which is the total area from the outside of the walls on every level you want to test that and then i would also be looking at the um, exterior envelope, the surface area of roof and walls that are required to make your three-story proposal versus a two-story proposal, because those are going to drive, going to drive the cost. You know, as you go more vertical, your area of walls goes up as a percentage, but your roof area goes down, and it really depends on the built form and the plan. You know, uh, but you want, if you're cost conscious, you're going to want to look at those factors. And, you know, also you're going to obviously you may have a design idea in mind where you're offering a particular amenity 
uh, enhanced private. I don't know what the objective is to go to three floors. You may not want to talk about this on an open call, but uh, if you have a good reason for going to three floors, I mean, Tony, you're 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 running the competition. And I, I would leave it with you, but I don't think there's any. There's not an there's not a code barrier or zoning barrier to you being three stories versus. Oh, two. that's correct. That's correct. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, this is either for Frank and or Andrew, your opinion on this one. So are there any special requirements for ventilation systems or planning taking into account the conditions of the COVID pandemic? So Frank, do you think there, um, would you like to see any uh, ventilation, kind of unique ventilation systems? That's a, that's a good question question um in light of covid um do we want any special applications with respect to the heating cooling ventilation systems um you know what i'd like to think that through a little bit yeah and, and get I, back to the team i think that's a yeah. good question that we should I contemplate mean, yeah I, frank i could give some context in terms of what what we're finding with our you know we have a lot of clients kind of asking similar questions in different building types right now there's currently no code or legislative change um, for, you know, related to COVID in terms of provision of mechanical, electrical, and ventilation requirements. But what what I would definitely, and this is all this is covered, this is covered in the code anyway. You are not you are not going to be sharing any transfer of air, either return or supply air, between residential units and and you know i would and obviously you this is going to be covered in the code as well a residential program needs operable windows so you can ventilate with fresh air i would i would just say as, as a matter of good practice to focus on an environment where you have uh, lots of access to natural ventilation uh and um and you have independent unit you have independent heating and cooling if we in fact are providing cooling for each unit, those those would be the kind of basics. But there isn't any any kind of code now. When it comes to the planning of the building, you know, elevators, for example, have become really challenging because uh, elevator uh, occupancy um, is really affected. People don't want to ride an elevator with someone else anymore, so that that makes the efficiency of your elevator go way down. So what we have been asked and people have been considering investing in extra elevators or going to a digital automated system which at least increases the call time and efficiency of the elevator an on-demand digital call system so those are the sort of things that we've seen at this stage there's nothing in the books yet so um, i would just use common sense and we've all been reading about how fresh air natural ventilation access to outdoor space, those are all kind of important factors and you you would want to may want to provide those and in some cases have to provide those in a residential building by code. Okay. Now, if, and if we want to interpret this this this, you know, if with the team our team wants to kind of kind of huddle and think about more deeply about what the implications are and whether we want to request any requirements, we could, we'll do that, but but currently, you know, it, it is more or less business as usual in terms of how buildings are going up. Okay. Um, next question. By default, the facade of our building is provided with a soft membrane. Is additional anti-vandal coverage required? Um, so I guess this is for Tony or Frank, if you have an opinion on that. Um, you know, I know in the past, what we've done, for example, is we've had, say, the first three floors of a building were in brick, and then above that, it was uh, a treatment which is called EFIS. Um, there's another term for it, I can't remember. Um, so I, I would think uh, maybe for the lower floors, uh, you, you might want to think about that. Yeah, I would say, you know, as, as owners and operators of buildings, I mean, graffiti is part of life and being able to, you know, remove the graffiti is important, you know? So I, I, when I think of, you know, being an owner of a building, 
I want to be able to maintain it to a certain, you know, standard, a higher, yeah, high standard, I would say. And uh, and yeah, I would I would like to see some consideration given to uh, either a, you know uh, putting a surface uh, that can be easily you know washed or cleaned or, or sandblasted to get rid of the graffiti, or as a minimum, uh, you know, be able to. Uh, I don't know, paint it over again, for example. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but uh, but graffiti is uh, it's the fact of life, and uh, we want to be able to remove it uh, you know, if, if we get tagged. Yeah, I wasn't thinking of, I was thinking more of somebody taking a pen um, and just sort of idly standing around, not that they came to vandalize the building, that, mm -hmm. but people, you know, standing on a corner waiting and if they're near a building. They, they just yeah. sort of end up uh, so so yeah. hopefully yeah. that answers the question yeah yeah I, I mean i would think if with any non non conventional building material and this is if this is kind of a membrane structure an inflatable structure i mean you because the tall building will require it to be non-combustible so it's really important that whatever this is made out of is non-combustible and that's covered in the code and we may need to look at Sometimes you have to get materials tested non to in, in Canada if they aren't already classified uh, through the Canadian standards, CSA. Um, and, and I think I would also, I would think a general durability, you know, some, what happens if someone has a truck with a bladder on the back, you know, is it puncture proof? Is it, I think there needs to be a level of durability that's achieved in the lower levels for sure. Mm -hmm just wear and tear and potential for tearing i don't you know i don't know what the membrane is exactly made of but puncturing tearing or you want something that can can withstand you know uh kind of general general abuse and then something that's that's not combustible you know think the hindenburg we don't want that right so good robust building um next question from alex are there any typical costs for 3D printer rentals that we can use for this project. Getting pricing from 3D printer manufacturers has proven to be fairly challenging so far. So um, I would say we, we, this is the part that we're looking to you for um, in being resourceful and offering your solution and process. Um, so uh, while we, 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 we don't want to um, give pricing for printer, 3D printer rentals or any kind of equipment. We will help you if you said, this is the kind of equipment that um, I need to bring to the site for transportation purposes, for instance. But um, as we said in the last um, presentation in November, what we're doing is we want you to bring the technology and we'll support you to build the building um, and do the administration and um, construction part. But we, for all the technology aspects, we view it as your responsibility. Um, so next question uh, is regarding construction schedule. This is regarding the BIM, um, construction schedule, BIM 4D, and cost schedule, BIM 5D. Are these sections supposed to develop, to, supposed to be developed in some specific software like Timeliner? What are the requirements for these sections? Can they be presented in the form of regular tables, construction schedule 4D and construction schedule 5D? Are these sections supposed to do, uh, okay, so sorry, that's a repeat. Okay, so um, we've, uh, we've offered the uh, site plan in Auto Revit as well as I think AutoCAD and other formats. Um, we had a question earlier last week, uh, somebody was using Skip. Google SketchUp. So um, with, for, with your construction schedule and costing, in the ideal case, we would like it to be presented in a BIM model. And there's a lot of different free software um, that you can use for that. And in the um, videos that we're gonna be releasing this week, we make some suggestions on that as well. So there are some free versions that you can use. If um, for whatever reason you cannot use the software, then uh, we would accept equivalent output. Um, but 
keeping in mind that conception schedule sequencing, for instance, is better illustrated in um, BIM. Um, so it's to your benefit to use uh, these tools. Um, but if for absolutely reason you can't use it, then we would accept, for instance, um, cost schedule like in the Excel sheet that we gave you. In fact, we want you to output whatever it is into your Excel sheet so it's all comparable. And as well, we would accept a standard kind of um, Gantt chart or timeline in Microsoft Project or there's a number of tools that you can use. But be as detailed as possible because um, there's gonna be 20 submissions, very detailed submissions. And so the better that you're able to communicate your idea, the better that we can understand and evaluate it. So I hope that answers the question. Um, contestants are required to provide the following outputs from their BIM um, for the small building in PDF format of maximum 25 horizontal legal size documents. Please specify the size uh, of the legal size. Okay, so legal. Uh, it's eight and a half by 14 inches. Eight and a half by 14 inches. Okay. So it's eight and a half by 14 inches. Uh, we don't want you to print it out, just print it out in PDF, but that's the size of the document that we'd like to see. Um, next question, is it possible to get from you the initial data for the design in any formats other than Revit, DWG, PLA, et cetera? How important it is to develop a commitment to Autodesk Revit? So um, like we said, the site plan has been provided in other formats. Um, if you haven't received it, please contact Lisa. Um, she has those alternative formats. Um, we are not committed to Autodesk Revit, although most likely if we submit a model, we will be reviewing it in Autodesk Revit. But if not, we would consider other formats as well, as long as they're equivalent. Okay, next question from Shazil. Well, I think I, I would just also add, as long as we can read them, if we, as long as there's, you know, uh, compatibility or an ability to translate them into, you know, kind of industry standard that we'd be mm -hmm. familiar with. Okay. Um, from Shazil, heating utility provisions, gas, et cetera, cooking fuel requirements. Um, so uh, I think this question was answered earlier. So typically we are expecting uh, gas to be eventually phased out in Ontario for um, environmental reasons, and it is currently being encouraged. So um, all heating, cooking, energy usage, we would recommend using electricity. So assume that you're using electric. Um, Shazil, again. HVAC exhaust, please elaborate. HVAC plant machinery replacement, ideal locations, any recommendations? So Frank, can I get you to yeah, answer this question? Yeah, I could speak to that. So um, in the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning costing breakdown, we've asked you to isolate the cost of uh, exhaust systems. Typically uh, in, a high, in, a, in a large building, there will be requirements for bathroom exhaust, um, right. a, a kitchen exhaust, kitchen. which is sort of a range hood over the stove. You may also want to provide exhaust fans for garbage handling areas or, or, or uh, mechanical areas that require exhaust for, you know, because of heat generating equipment. Um, so this is what uh, we envisioned to, to capture for costing purposes. We'd like you to isolate the exhaust systems that are going into the building. Um, as far as placement of machinery in the building, we would like to avoid a basement here. Um, um, so, um, uh, you know, it's really up to you where you want to put the uh, machinery uh, in Ontario. Uh, typically, we see mechanical uh, rooms being built on roofs. Uh, these mechanical rooms house um, central ventilation equipment that's used, for example, uh, pressurization of corridors or staircases or elevator shafts as may be required by code. So um, the roof is usually a place to look at for housing this stuff. 
Some of you may say, well, geez, I want my roof to be a green space, a garden. That's, that, that's great. You need to figure out where to put the mechanical equipment if it's not gonna go on the roof. But uh, again, I'd, I'd like to avoid um, uh, building a basement if at all well, possible. Well, I can clarify that. We're, uh, the plan is not to build a basement. There you go. So. And I would just add that, you know, the individual units should, you know, what's conventional is, is to have a heat pump and a combination potentially of radiant heating um, that is specific to the unit. So located within it, usually a closet of some kind on an exterior wall. Okay. That, that would not be a set, that would not be a central heating and cooling system. Mm -hmm. Okay, so from Shazil, any telecommunication requirements, shared utilities possible, is that possible? Like for example, a laundry room. So uh, we are assuming that you will put um, internet and uh, internet and telephone, a uh, wired copper line. And in terms of shared uh, laundry or utilities, um, Shared laundry is, uh, I think it's, we'll leave it up to you as your choice. Um, some higher end buildings in, in Ontario, Canada, they have individual, each unit has their own laundry facilities. And in other buildings, they have a shared laundry facility. So um, for the marketability of your building, it would, and the points associated with that in terms of livability, we'd get, you know, obviously recognize more points for marketability and livability if it was shared, um, oh, sorry, it was individual laundry. But um, if, if it's a cost issue, then it's better to have a shared facility. So we'll leave that to you as your design decision. Uh, uh, next. Yeah, I think I could just sort of try and help and give some guidance. The, um, the cost issue, I, I would expect, uh, would drive to a, a shared facility we're talking about in the big building. Uh, um, and um, I, I, I would leave that, that with you. Um, and in the small building, I think that's up to you uh, what, uh, what you would think you, you need. Okay. okay. So next two questions from Alex. First question, does the small building need BF access? Not sure what BF Bar barrier free access. Barrier free access. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so well, you know, I mean, let's uh, let's let's clarify that. I mean, it's a you know, if it doesn't have an elevator, which we don't want to give it, I'm sure, you know, right, Tony? Yeah. I think that's an unnecessary cost, so it would not be barrier free. Uh, the ground, you know, you could provide a barrier free unit at grade, but the upper level would, would not be barrier free. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the team wants to re reconvene and say, let's say one of the units at grade is barrier free. The other two are, don't, do not need to be, that'd be one approach, but, but we, Tony, it's really your call. It's a. Yeah. So I think we need to talk internally and then we'll communicate to everybody. Okay. Um, next question two questions relate to the unit mix. So Alex said, uh, these are the requirements for big building in the appendix. Um, ideal mix of residential types is approximately 30% studio, 50% one bedroom, 20% uh, two bedroom types. And Shazil also asked um, unit mix per floor. So do you have a preference? for uh, unit mix per floor or it's really the building. And I think earlier it was discussed, um, Andrew mentioned that, you know, sometimes what they do here is they design certain types of buildings, one bedrooms, two bedrooms or studios, and then build in some flexibility into your design so that if the market um, wants more of one type that we can put, put more in. So we've suggested a mix, but do you have a preference for mix per floor? unit mix per floor. Yeah, I think yeah, I, I, I don't, sorry, I, I don't think so. I think we were, when, when I say that, uh, we weren't, uh, I think we're indifferent unless somebody has another idea on the mix per floor. It, it really looking at 
uh, the overall building uh, yeah. a distribution of different type units because you may find uh, just layouts uh, end up uh, being more efficient putting all of one type on one floor and and that uh, that's fine well i think we should i mean this is again a conversation for our team i think that the fairest thing to do is to publish a mix based on a percentage yeah. and, and that everyone conforms to and i think yeah you're right we're probably agnostic around the mix mix per floor although i would say because it is a tall building you're going to be extruding vertically and and structurally the simplest thing will be to transfer you know will will to be to have the same structural arrangement on every floor which sometimes dictates that you have the same mix uh on every floor For a sure. typical floor a typical floor plate basically so but let us let's i think we should get back to you on the barrier free ratio and the mix ratios right okay. Okay, next question. So we're almost at the end of the questions. Uh, final uh, one question from Dimitri. What should we prepare for for the March check-in? So um, for the March check-in, March check-in, we're, we're going to be, uh, you know, here you can talk to us about whatever you want. So if you have particular questions about your design or clarifications that you um, need that are unique to your design. Um, then please talk to us about that. Uh, send us information in advance so that we can review. Um, you know, uh, you know. Show us. You could do whatever you want. So you could show us your building. We can give you feedback on it. Um, you could, uh, you know, uh, need, if you need specific help on transportation logistics. Um, estimates for specific things like windows or doors or you know, whatever it is, um, talk, to, to talk to us about those unique issues. Um, we do plan to have future check-ins. So this one will be the first one. So we'll probably check in once every one and a half or two months. But um, it's really your opportunity to talk to us about your design um, and for us to help you uh, resolve any issues or problems that you're having related to the construction and the constructability of your, your design. Um, so at the beginning, Ed said, at the beginning, you said you would address the definition of 30% complete. Is that still intended? So um, I, I think I'm gonna leave that one to the end. I'm, I think some of these other questions we can answer more quickly. So. Um, are you sure you want to wire telephone into the building? Everyone has a cell phone now, why a landline? Um, yes, yeah, so we recognize that, but just plan for one anyways, um, and it might be required. Um, yeah, and I was just gonna say, and someone just, Vladimir just said, at minimum telephone lines are used for fire alarm and tie-ins. Yeah, so there's some, might be some infrastructure that still requires a connection to the phone line. Um, for example, we know that utilities like um, we work with Hydro One, for instance, and they have certain electrical and control systems that require a dedicated phone line for the building. Um, you might also have meters that require metering um, for each unit to measure your electricity, and that may require a phone line, like a hard copper line. So we're, we're saying plan one and consider one anyways. It's not just for communications, it's for the safety systems and control systems for the building. Um, so I don't think there's any other questions other than the question about 30% design. So I'm going to switch over to the rules and I guess I'll ask Andrew to um, just talk a little bit about uh, his expectations for the 30% design, which is in section, I think it's section five of the rules. And I'm just gonna show, pull up the screen here. So Andrew, can you talk to us a little bit about what you expect? Um, what is the difference between 30% uh, and 100% design? I think maybe I, I'm muted. Yeah, that's the problem. The difference really is is in the level of detail. So at 30% design, we have all of the drawings that you would need to build this building in terms of its configuration. 
So we have complete elevations, plans, reflected ceiling plans, interior elevations, site plan, and we could be submitting it, the project for a building permit and site plan approval. Uh, well, not quite building permit, but, permit, but we're very close to being ready for building permit. And um, what is missing is uh, specific construction details um, of the entire building. But you see here what we're looking at um, to get wall sections at one to 125, or sorry, one to 25. Um, we'll have typical details at one to 10 or one to five, which are indicative. They're not comprehensive. That's really what's missing. I would say the first five categories of drawings, um, you know, wall sections, elevations and plans, they're all complete. And what then we have a limited number and we're, we're asking here for four details <clears throat> at one to 10 or one to five, which show how the thing goes together and, and allow us to estimate, validate or understand that your, your proposal aligns with your costing. Um, so that when you, we look at the details, we don't say that is either unbuildable or incredibly expensive to build. But to actually build the building, to get to 100%, you're going to have sheets and sheets of those details at one to 10. You'll have dozens and dozens of them. So um, it's really about the detailed uh, fit out. From the perspective of your building systems and structure, um, you know, you will have indicative drawings and we feel that there will be a lot of um, development in the structural, mechanical and electrical detailed drawings. That'll probably be the biggest gap between 30% and 100% completion. And you see here in this list of deliverables, we are placing an emphasis on the logistics. So the scheduling, um, the kind of sequencing and uh, the, the costing. So, so that, that that is quite developed and, and you know, your drawings need to be developed enough for you to be able to stand behind the cost and the schedule of this, of, of this project. Obviously there'll be some variance, there'll be some, all, there's always uh, contingencies beyond our control, but you know, we want to understand the scope of your building, the design and what it's made out of completely and be very close to being able to take this to an authority uh, to, to submit for site plan and submit for building code. Uh, when you submit for, for, for permit, for building permit, it's really a code review and a zoning review. And they, um, they are not looking for every detail in the building to be resolved, but they want to understand that it can stand up. They want to understand that it meets code in terms of its insulation values, the way it's put together. So it is a, yeah, you know, it is a, you're in the, for those of you who are familiar with the construction and, and uh, industry uh, and, and architectural design industry, you are entering the construction documents phase. You know, you've got all of the, of the, of the planning and configuration completely resolved. And really it's about the details uh, to finish in the, the final stretch. Right. And Andrew, I assume that, let's say if, um there was one or two minor misinterpretations of the Ontario Building Code that you and your team would pick that up and help, um, you know, make sure yeah. that that's on yeah. par. But we are hoping and expecting that they will uh, review that and throughout the, the next few months work through some of those details so that it's ready, it's sort of almost ready to be submitted for a building permit, right? Yeah, correct. I mean, I think the thing that, um, that's what we really want to use these upcoming one-on-ones and workshops for is show us what you've got and, and we'll try and catch any, any kind of glaring inconsistencies or, or non-compliances and, and, and help you correct those. And, um, and so that you're 30%, uh, uh, 30% submission is, you know, is buildable and, and ready to go forward as a, to get a permit. Okay. Okay, so I think that's the end of the um, list of questions that we received. Is there anyone who uh, has any other burning questions that they'd like to 
put before us or um, we'll give the floor to you. Okay, so it looks like we've answered all the questions for today. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, we're very excited to see what you've come up with and uh, for the future conversations that we have with you. Oh, it looks like there's one more. Oh, uh, do you intend to reveal the names of the teams that are still in? So that has been published already. Um, I think Lisa, you could send uh, the list of the teams that are um, in stage two. I think we published that yep. two weeks ago. It's, so uh, you, Lisa will send you a link at the end of this uh, call. It's on um, the platform anyways. There's a tab that we added called news uh, where you can find all the names. I can, but I can just send you the link to that tab. Um, also, I just wanted to, oh, somebody just posted them also on the chat. So. Oh, somebody just posted it. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> okay. And uh, after uh, maybe, uh, could our team stay on and Andrew, so we could uh, discuss some of these issues? Sure. Yeah, so um, so Lisa has already posted uh, today's presentation um, on the platform, um, I think as well as the um, construction cost template that we reviewed with you earlier today. So both are on the FAQ tab of um, the, the website. And we're going to review all the questions that we received today and some of the follow up items, um, barrier free and unit mix, etc. We'll post it um, as on the FAQ as well. So you have answers to that. And yes, the recording will be shared with everyone so they have access to it. And so I hope that you got the message today that, um, you know, we, in addition to the people that you see today, there's more people in the background, a uh, team of people that are willing and ready and able and really excited to uh, work with you and support your ideas and um, bring your ideas to life. So um, thank you for participating in this, uh, this stage of the competition. And we look forward to talking with you um, later at the beginning of next month. Right. Yeah. So um, again, uh, the, I haven't just a small correction. I haven't posted the presentation yet, but the cost to template. I will post the presentation as uh, along with the recording of today's um, meeting. And also, um, I'm gonna try to uh, my best to get get enough. For, uh, we have to look into that because I noted all the questions and I took some notes, but I'll just need your help, uh, guys. Maybe you can look over that, uh, Anthony, Frank, Andrew, and Jung, to, and then we can even post the questions that you asked um, in the FAQ section. So we have everything that has been said today in written form and easy to access as well. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you. Good Thank luck. you a lot. Uh, good luck. Um, I think the next step will be uh, the individual check-ins. Don't forget to book those and prepare. As Nung was saying, you can send uh, any question and any information that you want to share with the team before that already. Um, so that, that helps uh, for Nung. And I think it's Nung, Anthony, and Frank, and maybe also Emily uh, um, holding these uh, meetings so they can prepare. And as Nung said before, it's really for you to talk about anything that you need and what your questions are specific to your project. And then we'll also announce the more specifics on the topics for the second workshop uh, soon. Thank you so much. Bye.